Welcome along, fans of architectural history. This time around, we're going to travel back in time to the late 1800s to check out the Dakota. The reason for micro lessons such as this is to celebrate the hard work and great triumphs of visionary people such as builders and architects. It's also to help people understand what the architectural and design elements are when they are looking at buildings. Also, in my opinion, studying architecture and design can help people increase their powers of observation that could be used in other areas of their lives. So, let's get rolling. The Dakota is a luxury apartment building located at 1 West 72nd Street on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in New York City. It occupies the entire block front between West 72nd Street and West 73rd Street. It is probably the most famous apartment building in the world. The Dakota was constructed between October 25, 1880 and October 27, 1884 on land owned by Edward Cabot Clark. He was an attorney who represented Isaac Singer. He was an inventor who manufactured the Singer sewing machine. Now, Mr. Singer did not invent the sewing machine. He did invent, however, the part that made it incredibly functional. But the problem is that all these inventors whose parts were being used kept suing him and kept suing each other. And so his legal fees were going through the roof. So, in lieu of paying his substantial legal fees, he just kept offering Mr. Clark percentages of his business until they were equal partners. And together, those guys made incredible fortunes. Mr. Singer eventually packed up and moved to England with his family. He had nearly two dozen children with about 20 different wives and girlfriends. So it seemed best for the image of the company for him to take all of his money and skedaddle. Mr. Clark traveled quite a bit to Europe and he was impressed with how the French were living in flats and he figured that New Yorkers should probably live the same sort of way. And so when he returned to New York, he hired Henry Janeway Hardenberg for some smaller projects and then they worked together on some smaller apartment buildings and then finally they began working on the Dakota. Now let's talk about the architecture a little bit. First, I'd like to clear something up. A lot of people like to call the Dakota's architecture Gothic, but it isn't that at all. I think people just use the word Gothic for anything that they associate with being dark and dreary, and maybe that's because they saw too many vampire movies or episodes of Dark Shadows, and they think the word Gothic means something that it doesn't. For starters, the Dakota is not dark and dreary. It's actually very bright and cheerful. I think most people just think it's dark because they see photos of John Lennon in front of it in the 1970s. So obviously the building was kind of dirty, but it wasn't dark. It didn't use dark stones and it didn't use dark bricks. And so people really need to stop referring to the Dakota as Gothic. It's not. In fact, it's best to describe the exterior as German Renaissance. And some of those features are being made of brick and the use of the classical orders and mathematically precise ratios of height and width combined with a desire for symmetry and proportion and harmony. By the way, the Dakota was built before the days of steel frame construction. So when you look at the building, it's actually being held up by stones and bricks. In fact, the exterior walls at the ground level are more than two feet thick, and the walls narrow incrementally as the building rises. And so when you get up to the seventh level, the exterior walls are 12 to 16 inches thick. Now let's talk about the name. Anyone who has read any of my books or watched any of my videos knows by now that the story of how the Dakota got its name is a myth. No one ever heard that silly story until the 1930s when someone made an uneducated assumption about it during a newspaper article. But that's it. Nothing more than that. It was not based in fact. The building was named the Dakota because Edward C. Clark liked the name. He also liked what the Dakota territories represented as far as people with new wealth making fortunes in the northwestern portion of the United States. So it has nothing to do with the location. So the next time you're having a conversation with somebody about the Dakota and they say, hey, did you know that it got its name because it was so far away from everything else that it may as well have been in the Dakota territories? You know that that person doesn't know what they're talking about, so you can go ahead and correct them. It has nothing to do with the location, especially when you consider that Edward C. Clark and Henry Janeway Hardenberg put together another building called the Wyoming that was located nearly 20 blocks south of the Dakota. So he just liked the name. That's it. Now, let's check out the building. 
It is seven stories beneath the roof and an additional two stories in the attic. And then there's additional space up there in the gables. The south, east, and north facades are of yellow brick, and the west facade is of red brick. Now let's check out the lower section. Along the sidewalk is a low stone wall with ornate iron designs of Poseidon and his sea serpents. On the other side is a dry moat with thick, wide stones. Along the ground floor are square-headed sash windows. The building's original restaurant was located right there on the southeast corner. Now looking up along the second floor, you can see arch-headed sash windows. And there are also Oriel windows all the way up to the eighth floor on the south side. And you can see balconies with iron railings on the ends of the second floor on the east side of the building. And above that is a terracotta spandrel with ornate designs. Oh, and you can see bay windows in the center of the south and east sides of the building. And on all the corners are coins. And checking out the middle section, you can see that there are additional balconies here and there on the south and east and north sides. And some of them are decorated with grotesque faces. And looking all the way up along the entire seventh floor level is an iron railing that wraps around the three street-facing facades. And looking above that, you can see that the roof has high gables ornamented with slate shingles and copper. In the upper levels are stone and copper dormer windows. And at the peak of the gables, you can see an assortment of ornate stone finials. Now let's check out the entryway. The main entry to the building is located on West 72nd Street. To the left is a sentry box. On each side of the entry are stone bases with cast iron urns filled with evergreens. In front of the arch main entrance is a large ornate gate. The arch main entrance is a porte cochere that was built for horse-drawn carriages to be able to enter so that the passengers can disembark in inclement weather. And on the sides are beautiful lanterns and up above is a gorgeous groined ceiling. In the center of the Dakota is a large courtyard. In addition to being a place for residents to congregate, it also provided a turnaround for the horse-drawn carriages. All right, now let's talk about the lobbies. Unlike most other apartment buildings or hotels, the Dakota does not have a central lobby. There is a security office to the right of the Port Cochere, where residents can pick up packages and that sort of thing, but that's it. I've been in there. There really isn't much room to even move around, which is fine. It is not a place to hang out. For the most part, it's a place where visitors go to check in, and that way whoever is behind the counter goes ahead and alerts the resident that you have arrived. But the Dakota does have four different lobbies, and they are each located at the top of a flight of steps in each quadrant of the courtyard. And in each one, there is a staircase and passenger elevator to bring residents and guests to the upper stories. The apartments are really large. The ceilings on the ground floor level are 15 feet in height, and they lower incrementally until the top stories that have 12 foot high ceilings. For the most part, the master bedrooms and parlors face the street, and the kitchens and dining rooms face the courtyard. Now, a lot of that has changed over time as apartments were divided up and reconfigured. Originally, the Dakota had 65 apartments with 4 to 20 rooms. Today, there are over 100 apartments. Service stairs and elevators are located mid-block from the courtyard and offer direct access to the kitchens. The Dakota is perhaps most famous because of its notable residents. When the Dakota was completed in 1884, it attracted wealthy and successful tenants, including members of the Steinway piano family. I've listed the names and published the photos elsewhere, but the most famous resident was obviously John Lennon. And of course, Yoko Ono lived there and Sean Lennon. It's kind of interesting that Sean Lennon sort of gets forgotten in the list of residents, but he lived there for quite a while, and someday he will be inheriting quite a bit of real estate in the building. Lauren Bacall was a resident, as was Roberta Flack and Lillian Gish. Rex Reed still is a resident as of the date of this recording. Rudolf Nureyev was a resident, as was Albert Mazels, who I knew. Gilda Radner lived there, and Joe Namath, and also William Henry Pratt, best known by his stage name, Boris Karloff. The New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission designated the building as a city landmark in 1969, and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1972. And so this concludes this micro-lesson about the Dakota. If you live at the Dakota, or you know somebody who does, and you want to invite me over for coffee or tea sometime, please feel free to shoot me an email. 
If you want to support my research, please sign up for a subscription at my website, audibleadventures.com. That website also has a page with links to all of my books. You can also download the Audible Adventures app for iPhone and Android. If you have any thoughts about this subject matter, please put those in the comments below and share what's on your mind. If you enjoyed this video, please share it and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Until next time, I wish you safe travels and all your journeys.